Today we are outside the city in the town of Oliva. Oliva, Cordoba, Argentina. And we're here to see the Museo Nacional de Malvinas. National Museum of the Malvinas. Come along, let's go. So what is this place and why are we here? Well, it's sort of a, a museum. Uh, it's a large, uh, very loud motorcycle out here on the street. It's a, it's a large outdoor museum. It's a collection of mostly uh, like fighter jets and other aircraft. And there is uh, like just some other stuff here that's uh, left over from the Malvinas conflict. And uh, as we look around, we, well, I want to talk more about the Malvinas conflict because we, we talked about this uh, in a previous video, in the video about um, the relationship, relationship between Argentina and Great Britain and the, the um, history. And uh, that video got a lot of views actually, for surprisingly, for one of my like uh, pretty early videos on the, uh, on the channel. So it seems like people are really interested in this. And it's something that I didn't go completely into detail in that video, so I want to talk about it more in this one. The museum's actually all the stuff that's behind me here, and before we actually get into it, I think, you know, we, we mentioned in that previous video uh, that there's a long sort of disputed history over the Malvinas slash Falkland Islands. Depending on who you talk to, if you talk to someone in Argentina, they're going to say it's called the Malvinas. If you talk to someone in the United Kingdom, they'll say it's called the Falkland Islands. So the name is not the only thing that's disputed. Um, the claims, I think I mentioned in the previous video, go back to like the 1800s, but they even go back like far further than that. Um, if you go back to like who saw the islands first and you use that as a method of who discovered it, it really could be anybody. Any of the colonial powers that were sailing around down there back in like the 1500s, they're all reports of them spotting uh, a group of islands and none of them are concrete reports as to like this is the actual Malvinas Islands that they spotted. So you could say the Spanish saw them first, you could say the English saw them first, you could say the Dutch or the Portuguese saw them first. I mean that everybody was sailing around down there. And uh, it wasn't really until after the, uh, the Spanish uh, colonial era in Argentina ended after Argentine independence uh, in like 18, the early 1800s that um, you know Argentina laid claim to the islands and they actually governed the islands um, for about 20 years or so between Argentine independence and in 1833 uh, there was an incident in which um, uh, a number of U.S. fishing whaling vessels were uh, like captured by the uh, the provincial government of the of that you know the Argentine government that was ruling over the Malvinas at the time, and it created kind of a like political and diplomatic crisis in which the United States actually sent a um, uh, like a, a warship down there, and um, and in sort of the the power vacuum that followed that struggle the argentine forces withdrew from uh from the islands and the british sailed in they took it over in 1833 and they've basically been administrating uh, the islands ever since 1833. so uh like i said a long and disputed history and i'm sure you know like like from some of the comments that were in the previous video uh, people have very strong feelings about who exactly is in charge of those islands and who has sovereignty over those islands. Um, here in Argentina, uh, it's it, it, uh, it's very clear here in Argentina that, that people believe that Argent, Argentina has sovereignty over the islands. And like I said, both governments, as far as uh, Argentina's government and the government of the United Kingdom, they both claim sovereignty. The United Nations, for its part, uh, has basically done uh, nothing, which, you know, is a, kind of a classic United Nations thing to do. Uh, they basically, since like 1960s, 65 or so, have said that it's disputed territory and that it's up to Argentina and uh, the United Kingdom to sort of 
decide amongst themselves who the territory belongs to and that they will you know reconvene a commission every year to update the status and they've been doing that every year since 1965 and the status as far as the united nations uh is concerned still remains disputed so way to go united nations way to way to get shit done um anyway that's that's basically the broad the broad long history of the dispute but the uh the actual war has its own sort of history leading up to it and uh I think it's probably time we get up and start walking around towards the museum and we could talk more about uh, more about the history of the war itself and the lead up to it. You can see right here the sign right out in front, Las Malvinas Son Argentinas. And uh, I've seen this, this uh, like a sign like this with sayings like this all over Argentina. Las Malvinas Son Argentinas, meaning the Malvinas are Argentine. Argentine. Uh, so, like I said, the position of the Argentine government and pretty much everybody here in Argentina is that the, the islands belong to Argentina. So the lead up to the war is, uh, from an outsider's point of view, from my point of view, is kind of this tragic, um, sort of uh, a tragic uh, situation of like political missteps and uh, both sides misjudging the situation. And, you know, from an outsider point of view, like I said, I'm, you know, I'm not from Argentina, I'm not from the United Kingdom. I have no, uh, no horse in this race, as the saying goes. So, but to me, it seems like, uh, oh, here's a, a plane right here. It seems like there were a lot of miscalculations on both sides and that this war really never actually needed to happen. And only now that it has happened and blood has been spilt and people still remember the, you know, the people who died and there's that increased the bad blood between the two countries. And now it has sort of, I think, prolonged the, uh, the dispute over the islands. And I don't really think that, you know, if uh, I think that without the war, the dispute may have actually been settled by now, diplomatically, because leading up to the war itself, neither side was um, as gung-ho about sovereignty over the islands as they are now. So, you know, the war itself contributed a lot to people digging in their heels over the issue of which country has sovereignty. Take a look here. This is a... FMA IA 58 Pukara. So this obviously is not a fighter jet. I mean, it has propellers on the side and big rocket pods. So this is like a, a ground attack plane. They would probably use this for close air support, things like that. Um, I don't know exactly what, uh, like what country made this, because that's the interesting thing, you know, there were a lot of, um, uh, on the Argentine side, there are a lot of different planes involved, different models, and they're made by different countries, like there's American A4 Skyhawks and French Mirage jets, so we're going to see those, of course. So the situation in both countries leading up to the conflict uh, was domestically uh, pretty, pretty bad. Yeah, they were both in pretty bad economic situation, uh, more so in Argentina than the United Kingdom, and both governments were uh, increasingly unpopular amongst the people of the two countries, respectively. Um, more so, arguably, in Argentina, and that's because the Argentine government was a military junta that had taken power in a coup d'état, overthrowing Isabel Perón in 1976. And uh, that government, the military junta, is uh, infamous, notorious for human rights abuses, for um, repression of the public, um, just, uh, you know, death squads, um, violent, violent actions against the public. I think the number that I read was 30,000 people were either killed or disappeared 
um, you know, political opponents of the junta, mainly leftist political opponents of the junta. And this is, of course, in the, you know, the, the Cold War era, when all of South America, basically, other than Argentina in 76, was, uh, were controlled by military dictatorships. A lot of those military dictatorships were supported or propped up by the United States. And as an American, as a citizen of the United States myself, I, uh, I would be, well, I, I have to, I have to uh, acknowledge that, you know, the United States played a large role in supporting the, uh, the dictatorship and a lot of the horrible things that they did here. Um, there is, there is a, um, a United States military organization known as the School of the Americas. They actually changed their name to something else now, WinSec, I think it is. Um, but back in the, in the day, during the uh, 60s and the 70s and the Cold War, they were the School of the Americas. And they trained, you know, tens of thousands of uh, officers in different Latin American militaries, many of whom uh, went on to commit horrible war crimes in Latin America. And, you know, of course, publicly, WINSEC or the School of the Americas or the Defense Department denies all of this. Um, but I don't know. You can do the research on your own, and I really encourage you to do it on the School of the Americas. Uh, we could make many, many videos about it, but that's obviously not what we're here to do. And uh, yeah, do your own research and figure out your own opinion. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, where there are massive, massive billowing plumes of smoke, there's got to be some fire. So the uh, denials of the Defense Department of the U.S., and of WINSEC or the School of the Americas, they kind of ring hollow when you look at all the atrocities that were committed by uh, graduates of the School of the Americas. So over there we see a, uh, that was a landing craft, landing craft used by the uh, Argentines to land on the Malvinas Islands. But uh, anyway, in the lead up, like I said, very unpopular governments on both sides. Uh, on the British side, the uh, Margaret Thatcher government, also a situation of economic uh, downturn in the United Kingdom, an unpopular government. And that just sort of leads to, um, well, to war for political reasons. War to distract the populations, war to uh, attempt to unite the population behind the government. And, uh, Unfortunately, that's, that's what happened in this situation. The uh, government of Galateri, that's the uh, Argentine president at the time. I put that in air quotes because, like I said, it was a military junta. And the three heads of the three branches of the armed forces, Army, Air Force, and Navy of Argentina, they were basically in charge of choosing who the president was going to be. And they sort of just rotated in. Um, you know, one of themselves. So it was Galatieri's turn, basically. And um, they, had, uh, they had planned the invasion for some time before they actually started it, kicked it off. Um, what actually kicked it off, strangely enough, you know, like I said, it was sort of a, a bunch of strange events and miscommunications. And there were a lot of off-ramps where it would have been possible for this war not to have happened. Um, but what happened was, on another island in the South Atlantic, called uh, South Georgia Island, there was, which was also uh, administered by the British, there was a, um, an Argentine scrap metal, like, company that was owned by an Argentine citizen, and there were some, um, workers coming from the mainland to work on the island. And reports are that aboard that ship, there were um, Argentine Marines disguised as workers. And when they landed on the island, they raised an Argentine flag on the island of South Georgia. And this essentially was a signal to the British, and uh, the British ended up sailing a, uh, a naval vessel from across the Atlantic towards the South Atlantic. And there was also a report of two uh, British nuclear submarines 
leaving the port of Gibraltar and heading towards the South Atlantic. That report is actually like uh, disputed at this point. It was something that popped up on British news. And uh, the military junta got wind of that and they decided, hey, if we're gonna do this invasion, uh, we're gonna have to do it now before those submarines get here because it's gonna be a lot harder to try and do an amphibious landing when there's uh, nuclear submarines hanging around. So they did it. And in April, April 2nd, I believe, of uh, 1982, they launched an amphibious landing and landed on um, on the, the Falkland slash Malvinas Islands. And it was relatively um, bloodless. I think one person died uh, in during the uh, during the amphibious landing. And other than that, they were able to take the islands like very very easily. And once they did. Uh, they, you know, they really were convinced that the British were not going to do anything about it and that the UN was not going to do anything about it because, I mean, up until that point, the UN hadn't done anything about it. They'd been reconvening that commission every year since 1965 and just came to the conclusion every year that, oh, well, it's still disputed and we're not going to do anything about it. So you can see why the uh, Argentine government, the uh, military junta, thought that they would be able to just sort of get away with this. They would be able to take the islands and uh, the British wouldn't do anything about it. But of course Margaret Thatcher, she uh, convened with her, the leaders of her, uh, her military and her, um, the head of her navy convinced her that the prestige of the nation was at stake. And so they had to go and take back the islands. So basically you're in a situation where both countries think that the prestige of the nation is at stake and neither of them are willing to back down. And interestingly, right after the uh, occupation, the, uh, the amphibious landing, uh, Ronald Reagan, um, you know, started peace negotiations essentially with, uh, with the Argentines. And uh, he spoke with Galtieri and told him, warned him that the British were not gonna back down and that if they didn't withdraw, that the British would um, come to try and take back the islands, that it would be a war, and that the Argentines would lose because at the time the British military was superior to the Argentine military in technology, in the number of forces that it could muster, and also in uh, the, the, the training, how well trained they were. And the story goes that Reagan warned Galtieri of this. Galtieri, you know, accepted the warning and then made an address to a huge crowd of people right outside the Casa Rosada, the president's office, in which he made a statement of, you know, to the effect of, well, if they're going to come, let them come, and we will fight them. So at that point, it was kind of on. Um, the, uh, the British were already on their way, and uh, the Argentines weren't backing down. So here we have an E.E. E. Canberra, Mark 62. I imagine this is an Australian plane because it's uh, Canberra, and Canberra is a city in Australia. This also looks like a, like a bomber, uh, sort of like a ground ground attack plane, and definitely not a fighter. Uh, yeah, B-102 it says on the side, so that's a bomber. And you can see actually on the side there are bomb markings which is probably, you know, how many, how many targets it hit. Every, uh, every sortie it flies, every target it hits. They'll put another bomb marker on there. So, we have another bomber here. So after that, the conflict sort of became uh, an international conflict, even though there were only two belligerents. Um, because, well, lots of countries, you know, stated their neutrality they were secretly helping one side or the other. The United States said that they were neutral and they were trying to initiate peace negotiations. Um, and actually, you know, leading up to the to the, um, the conflict, the United States had friendly diplomatic and military relations with both the United Kingdom and the Argentines. Like I said, um, Galatieri is a graduate of the School of the Americas. He, the, the, the military junta, was supported by the United States 
And, um, but, you know, when, when the war kicked off, the United States, even though they claimed to be neutral, they did make statements to the effect that Argentina was the aggressor. Um, later, they sort of withdrew military aid to Argentina. And they provided military aid to the United Kingdom during the conflict, even though a lot of it was sort of clandestine and secret, like by providing um, military intelligence, satellite intelligence, and also allowing um, uh, allowing the use of um, U.S. military facilities for like refueling and things like that. So the United States, while they claim you know they claim to be neutral, they were clearly on the side of the United Kingdom in this conflict, and it was sort of that way for a lot of different countries. There were a lot of countries claiming to be neutral, uh, attempting to start peace negotiations but secretly or not so secretly supporting one side or the other. Peru, for example, tried several times to initiate peace negotiations, but while they were doing that, they were working a back alley deal or sort of like a back deal to sell uh, these right here, Mirage fighter jets, to, uh, to the Argentines. Chile also claimed to be neutral, but were providing uh, intelligence and a lot of other support to the, to the British. The Soviet Union claimed to be neutral, but it has now come out that they basically um, told uh, the Argentines in secret that they fully supported them. So, like I said, it sort of became an international thing, even though there were only two, two uh, militaries fighting in the conflict. And for a while, the, after, you know, about a month or so after the, um, uh, after the amphibious landing, there wasn't really any fighting. And that's because the British needed time to get there. I mean, it's very far. They had to muster up a whole naval force and, uh, and all the, you know, Marines that were going to go with. And they had to figure out, you know, how to get them down there. So they took a couple aircraft carriers, a bunch of landing ships, um, you know, like 10,000 or so Marines, and uh, put them on ships and headed down towards the South Atlantic. And by the time they got there, it had been almost a month of really not very much fighting, no, no actual fighting happening. But during that month, again, there were a lot of opportunities for, you know, an off-ramp where one side or the other could have backed down, but neither side was going to back down. This here... Hmm, Armada Argentina. There's no sign for this one. I wonder what this is. Looks just like a passenger jet anyway, but maybe this is like a troop transport. Maybe they would use this to fly troops from, uh, from the mainland out to the islands. I'm not sure. Of course, it makes the, uh, the conflict is logistically much more difficult for uh, both Argentina and for the United Kingdom because of where the islands are. They're, you know, well off the coast of Argentina. There's not a lot of uh, infrastructure on the islands themselves. So, you know, trying to fight a war over this, these two very small islands, very far off the coast, it's a logistical nightmare because people forget that when you're fighting a war, it's not just about getting your troops there, you know, once your troops are there and they're fighting, they have to eat and you have to supply them with ammunition and the wounded have to be uh, treated, which means you need medical supplies and, you know, you need fuel for everything, your, your ships, your jets, your landing craft, ground vehicles, everything. So it becomes a logistical nightmare trying to fight for these two islands way off the coast. Hmm. Arguably, the best opportunity for a peace negotiation came on uh, May 2nd of uh, 1982. And what happened was the Peruvians, the Peruvian government, had put out, laid out a peace plan in which basically both sides kind of just back off because, you know, at this point... Um, there hadn't been a lot of fighting, like I said. 
both sides would just back off, withdraw their forces, and negotiations would begin. And I think there was some hope amongst the international community that this would actually work and that they may be able to avoid further bloodshed. But um, on that same day, the Argentine cruiser, General Belgrano, was sunk. A uh, British, one of those British nuclear submarines, they uh, fired a torpedo and sank the Belgrano. And it's a controversial sinking because the Belgrano, or the claims, are that the Belgrano was actually outside of the exclusion zone. Essentially, the British had declared an exclusion zone around the islands and said that any Argentine ships within that exclusion zone would be fair game. And the Belgrano was outside of the exclusion zone. But the two militaries were in an open state of conflict. So it is controversial to this day, the sinking, and it is also the single largest loss of life in the conflict on either side. Over 300 sailors, Argentine sailors, were killed. And it happened, like I said, on the same day that that peace plan was proposed by Peru. And at that point, there was not going to be a peace negotiation. So much Argentine blood had been spilt. And at that point, the war was really, really on, like in full force. And here, this is an A4 Skyhawk. I recognize this. So this is a uh, American-made plane, actually. It's made by Douglas. And uh, like I said, the Americans were supporting the Argentines militarily up until the conflict. So the Argentines had a number of these in their air force. Take a look all, around, all the way around it. If you are a movie aficionado, and also, like fighter jets, you will recognize this plane from the movie Top Gun, 1986 classic, Top Gun. The A4 Skyhawk was uh, one of the planes that they used as like the aggressors in the Top Gun school to like practice against. So there's a little bit of movie trivia for you. And if you haven't seen Top Gun, what are you doing with your life? Go see Top Gun, it's a great movie see the sequel too. It's pretty damn good also. Well, after the sinking of the Belgrano, uh, a couple days later, a, um, a uh, British ship was also sunk. It was a British destroyer called the HMS Sheffield. And uh, in order to sink it, the Argentines used a very specific missile, a very high-tech French-made missile called an Exocet, specifically made for, uh, for taking out ships. And uh, that was actually the first time that anyone realized that the French had sold Exocet missiles to, uh, to the Argentine forces. So once again, you have another country that's loosely involved, really just uh, because of like, you know, military sales. But they sold the Exocet, uh, Exocet missiles, and one of those sunk uh, sunk a British destroyer. And, you know, hundreds of uh, British sailors lost their lives in that. And I will say, the British and the French don't always get along. In fact, most of the time they don't. And that did not really contribute much to a good relationship between the British and the French. But that is uh, beside the point of this video. And like I mentioned before, uh, the Argentines, they didn't expect the British to come in full force and try and retake the island. I think if they did, if they did know that the British were going to come in full force and try and retake the island, I don't know that they would have, um, that they would have initiated the assault in the first place. Because, unfortunately for them, they were outmatched technologically and in, in numbers, uh, the British force was significantly larger um, and also 
significantly um, like a better trained force than the Argentines. And eventually, after uh, probably about a month and a half of, um, of fighting, the Argentines surrendered because in late May, um, British, British Marines um, landed on the island and by the middle of June, they had managed to recapture both islands. Here you see A4 Skyhawk. You can see it from the front here. And over here, it looks like, well actually, hold on, what is this? There's some sort of a sculpture here I really want to take a look at. Very interesting sculpture. And then over here there's a memorial, it looks like. Looks kind of sim similar, <coughs> excuse me, to the memorial that we saw in Buenos Aires. It looks like there are plaques with the names of uh, the Argentine sailors and soldiers who died in the conflict. There's like a little uh, walkway going up here. An old, what looks like a 50 caliber machine gun. Walk up here. Yeah, looks like the names, there are names here. Now I wonder, Now I know there were more, more than this many soldiers. This does not look like enough. So I think these possibly are only, I'm not sure. I think these may be only soldiers who were from Cordoba province or maybe only the ones who, who were on the Belgrano. I'm not sure, I'm not sure. Maybe somebody knows and they can put it in the comments because the recorded deaths on the Argentine side was something over 600 and there's definitely not 600 names here. You step back. You can see there's a Argentine flag and the uh, outline of a soldier. It's a pretty moving monument. Let's head back down. Over here looks like a uh, anti-aircraft gun and this is a recreation of I guess the front end of the uh, of uh, the Belgrano I think. anti-aircraft gun here. This may actually be one that's actually from the Belgrano. I'm not sure. Um, but you know, like I said, the Belgrano was sunk. So this may just be like a similar one. There's another one on the other side here. There's a plaque over here on this. homenaje, like an homage from the government of the, this town and the province of Córdoba, commemoration of the 25th anniversary of the Day of Veterans of the War of uh, the Malvinas. Two doors here, they're locked up tight. I've seen from pictures that I think actually inside this, there's like 
some more stuff you can go in and see, but it looks like it's closed, um, locked up. But still a lot of good stuff to see outside here. A lot of very interesting stuff. A lot of very moving, um, you know, like, a, like the memorial and the different plaques and these. I think, I think these, yeah, are all the names of all of the soldiers and sailors who died. There's plaques all the way around on these little, these little uh, like concrete pieces. And you can see a lot of these say 2582, 2582, 2582. That's 2nd of May, 1982. That's the date that the Belgrano was sunk. And like I said, it was the largest single loss of life um, on either side really for the entire war. Looks like an anchor over here. Don't know if this is an actual, like the actual anchor of the Belgrano. I don't know if any of the wreck was raised um, or if it's still, if it's still out there. Um, this may just be like, you know, they put an anchor here and uh, just as part of the, as part of the whole thing. Here's a sign again. Also, you know, if you do, want to come here. It's, like I said, in Oliva. There's a website right there. You can take a look on it for more information. And if you're ever out here, um, it's a little bit, <laughs> it's kind of far away from the, uh, from the city of Cordoba. It's about an hour and a half bus ride. And uh, there's, not, there's not too much else around here. It's kind of a small um, agricultural town. There's a lot of farms around this area. Um, in some of the other videos, when we went out to like Vicha General Belgrano and Alta Gracia, that's going out to the uh, west of Cordoba, and that's into the mountains. If you go east of Cordoba, and this is southeast here, it's all flat uh, farmland. Well, I think we've seen what there is to see here at the uh, Museo Nacional de las Malvinas. And, um, you know, it's an outdoor museum. All of these, uh, these fighter just just sitting out here, gathering dust. And, I don't know, I'm... I'm sort of struck by a sense of... of uh, profound sadness and regret. Even though, like I said, I... You know, I have no stake in this conflict or the dispute over the islands. The United States did play a significant role in propping up both sides, both the military government, the military junta in Argentina, and by supporting the, uh, the government in the UK, Margaret Thatcher's government in the UK. And there's just something about this conflict specifically that is very sad because it really didn't need to happen you know there are some people who believe that all wars are terrible and that no war should ever happen and I personally happen to believe that people like that are naive and that they don't uh, either don't understand enough of history don't study enough of history or don't want to know enough about history because there are some wars that absolutely need to be fought and there are some wars that absolutely do not need to be fought and this one unfortunately falls into the latter category I think of course that's just my opinion as an outsider I it, it, it makes me uh, it always makes me profoundly uh, angry when a country or, or multiple countries engage in wars for political reasons, when they engage in wars to, uh, to rally the public and prop up their own power within a country. And that's really what happened in this conflict on both sides, really. 
and like I said, you know, the islands have been disputed for so, so long, hundreds of years. And and there's a possibility, I mean, who knows, but there is a possibility that had this war never happened, there may have been a diplomatic solution by now as to, uh, as to who maintained sovereignty. Things like that have happened before. I mean, the British and the Chinese came to an agreement over Hong Kong. Something like that could have happened here with the Malvinas. But um, too much blood has been spilt at this point. And I don't see any I don't see either side backing down from their claim anytime soon. Especially given the fact that um, you know, recently both sides, the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak of the United Kingdom and the new president of Argentina, Javier Millet, have both made statements, um, you know, uh, claiming their sovereignty and, and re reaffirming their claim to sovereignty over the over the islands. Now, one thing on for Millet's part, he did also say that that he believes that it's ultimately a should be a diplomatic solution to who maintains control over the islands and not a military solution. So that is promising. But neither side's backing down. And who knows? Who knows what the future's going to bring? But standing here amongst all of these these plaques these plaques with the names of dead Argentine soldiers and sailors. You know, young men who who never got to live, never really lived past probably their late teens or early 20s. Just makes me really sad because it's not a conflict that really needed to happen. And both sides had plenty of opportunity in both the lead up to the uh, to the beginning of the war and also in the first uh, stage of the war after the uh, Argentine amphibious landing but before the British force was able to arrive. There were plenty of off-ramps, plenty of opportunities for a peaceful solution and uh, while a peaceful solution and peaceful negotiations is not always in every case the best situation for a conflict. Some conflicts, like I said, need to be fought. For one like this, that really didn't need to be fought, who knows? It could have been, it could have been negotiated and settled peacefully, and many, many young Argentine and British men could have kept their lives. It's pretty tragic. It really is pretty tragic. Well, I'm standing out here in the shade because it's very hot out here. <laughs> and, uh, I am going to take a bus back to the city. It doesn't leave for another like two hours. I think I might find a cafe or something and sit down and just think about it. Think about what I saw here. You know, it's one thing to see like a mile, like the monument that we saw in Buenos Aires. To see like, uh, you know, a plaque with names on it. It's another thing to come here and to see the actual, you know, like actual military machines out here on display it really puts you like I don't know closer almost to the conflict well I think I've said all I could say about it I'm sure people are gonna have strong opinions about this one I mean I hope so honestly it's something that 
you know, when 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 this many people uh, die in a war, you should there should be strong opinions about it. And I'm sure, like I said, I'm sure people will have strong opinions about it. And uh, if you have them, you can put them in the comments down below. Other than that, I will say, even though this topic is a pretty somber topic, I hope you enjoyed the video, and uh, we'll see you again soon for the next one.